Thank you so much, Ambassador Mehta, for the nice introduction. First of all, um, it's really an honor for me to be sitting here and sharing um, some knowledge about uh, what I have learned in the past uh, several years uh, from my studies and from my research. But having said that, uh, that I must admit that my knowledge about the, the uh, geological and the geophysical aspects of Tibet is limited. Um, as um, almost, um, I, I should say, most of the participants here are CTA staffs, uh, so uh, I think we all have uh, a great deal of knowledge about the Tibetan culture, uh, the Tibetan religion, the Tibetan language, and the Tibetan way of life. Uh, so today, my attempt will be to add more to your knowledge by uh, sharing some of some information about the geological evolution of Tibet. So. Um, but having said that, um, I, should, I should tell you that the, uh, the geology of Tibet is a very complex topic. And there are a lot of technical um, terms. And uh, for me, uh, to explain it in a very simple and short, uh, short language is, is a big challenge. But anyhow, um, uh, I'll try my best. Okay, so in um, next half an hour, um, first uh, I will provide you with an overview of the Tibetan Plateau and its significance, and then um, we will discuss about the geological evolution of the Tibetan Plateau. And thereafter, um, um, since the, uh, the uh, actual formation of the Tibetan Plateau, how the Tibetan Plateau has been shaped and transformed, and uh, now there are a lot of uh, active structures which are formed on the Tibetan Plateau, and because of these active structures, the Tibetan Plateau is considered as one of the seism most seismically active region in the world. So um, this is uh, the map of the world, and uh, we, we have this Tibetan saying that which, which can be literally translated as, uh, um, you know, like the, uh, hello, hello. Which, hello, hello, yeah, which uh, we all know can be, hello, hello, yeah, which we all know can be literally translated as the, uh, you know, like the Tibet is virtually the roof of the world, and, um, and quite rightly so, you know, like if you look at this, if you look at the, um, map of the world, the, the Tibetan Plateau stand out at a, as a very distinct physical feature on, on the map of the world, so which is here. And um, the, the traditional Tibet, including uh, all the three provinces, more or less coincides with, with the um, actual boundary of the Tibetan Plateau. So uh, when we are saying Tibetan Plateau, uh, 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 I think uh, we are not wrong to uh, say that we are uh, more or less talking about the Tibet, the, the Tibet we know, uh, including three uh, uh, provinces. So here is uh, the satellite image of the Tibetan Plateau, and uh, as we know, is uh, surrounded by the Tsadam Basin on its north, uh, which is, which, uh, as Matthew pointed out, it is very rich in uh, mineral resources, and towards the south, uh, we have this Karakoram and Himalayan complex, which uh, forms the southern edge of the Tibetan Plateau, and towards the east, we have this forested area of the uh, Sichuan Basin. So a few facts about the, uh, the Tibetan Plateau uh, and its significance. Uh, Tibetan Plateau, uh, as we know, is the largest and highest uh, plateau to be ever, to have ever existed. Uh, you know, like it, it's, it's not today that that Tibetan Plateau is highest. In fact, Tibetan Plateau ha has been the highest and the largest in the entire geological history of the world. And 
The Tibetan Plateau uh, is uh, roughly 2.5 million square kilometers in area and uh, with an average elevation of around 4,500 meters. And um, if I ask you a question, what is the uh, largest and the deepest canyon in the world? And uh, some of you might be thinking Grand Canyon. If you're thinking so, then you're wrong. It's in fact the, uh, the great canyon of the Yalung Tsangpo, which is, which is the largest and the deepest. And in fact, uh, if I add something more, then um, the, the, the canyon of the Tsangpo is uh, 1,000 meter more, more than the twice the depth of the Grand Canyon. So if you multiply the depth of Grand Canyon by two and add 1,000 meter more, then you have uh, the, uh, the canyon on, on the uh, Yalung Tsangpo. And then uh, Tibet is also a region of high activity, high tectonic activity. And um, Tibet is still um, rising, and uh, uh, the geological term is the uplifting, at the rate of 10 mm per year. And this rate of high rate of uplift is being uh, countered by high rate of erosion. Erosion by the 10 major rivers which flow from the Tibetan Plateau at the rate of 2 to 12 mm per year. So these are some of the, some of the basic facts uh, to show that the Tibetan Plateau is really uh, significant. Now coming back to uh, the geological evolution of the Tibetan Plateau. Uh, few facts we all know from our uh, geography lesson that the Himalayas are formed by the collision of two plates, the Indian plate and the Eurasian plate, and uh, when these two plates collided, the Himalayas are formed. So in a nutshell, um, we can talk about this uh, in, in greater detail uh, in, in my next slide. So, but in a nutshell, uh, the, the Tibetan Plateau was formed because of the collision of Indian and Eurasian plate about 55 million years ago. And after the, after the initial collision, the Indian plate uh, moved northward at the rate of 35 to 50 mm per year. So um, yeah, uh, 35 to 50, uh, 50 mm per year is um, approximately the rate at which our fingernails grow in a year. So uh, you can, you can uh, have a sense of you know, like the, how the two plates are moving. And then uh, once the, the collision and the formation of the Tibetan Plateau uh, began, uh, the Tibetan Plateau uh, wasn't uplifted in, a, in a one single unit. In fact, the Tibetan Plateau was formed in different uh, fragments, different parts. So first of all, the central Tibet was uplifted, and the and the which was followed by the southern part of Tibet, and then the eastern part, and then the northern part. So we have different continental fragments which were uplifted successively and not as a single unit. And and uh, since uh, past 10 million years ago, uh, there has been a widespread extension, the lateral extension. So if we talk in, in a greater detail, as we all know, uh, the Indian plate shown here in red was uh, in fact uh, close to the African continent uh, around 180 million years ago. And thereafter, the Indian plate moved towards the uh, Eurasian plate and at about 55, or and some say 50 million years ago, the Indian plate collided with the Eurasian plate. So here's the animation to give you a sense of how this biggest crash, some scientists call it the biggest crash of the two land masses uh, in the history of the Earth. So how, the, because of the collision of the two plates, the Himalayas on the southern edge and the Tibetan Plateau towards its north was formed. So here is another uh, sketch to show the uh, location and the uh, actual elevation of the Tibetan Plateau. But the big question is, uh, how can something so vast and something, um, something so vast could remain, you know, like uh, high for such a long period of time? You know, like Tibetan Plateau has been uh, going against the force of gravity, gravity, you know, like, so um, since late, I think 70s, when Tibet was open to the outside world, uh, many scientists have uh, 
they have uh, conducted field research in, in the on the Tibetan plateau, and then they try to figure out wha what's what's actually happening. You know, like so. Uh, different scientists have come up with different ideas and different concepts and different theories, and some of them uh, are like uh, as is shown here are concept of underthrusting, concept of lower crystal flow, con concept, con concept of lithospheric shortening, and then intracontinental subduction, delamination, and extrusion. But uh, among these different concepts, uh, the three, are the three uh, concepts or proposals are most prominent. The first one is the concept of uh, crustal shortening. The, the, basic, the basic concept or the basic uh, uh, view about this uh, proposal is that the Indian plate, it, it moves towards the Eurasian plate, there's a Eurasian plate, and because of that, the, the, the land mass between the two plates, it, can, it gets squashed or it gets squeezed in between. And because of that, this whole land mass becomes shortened and it, it becomes folded and then in geology, there is a term called thrust, when one, one plate rises up above another. So folding and thrusting lead to the formation of a very high area, which is now the Tibetan Plateau. This, is, this was the initial idea. And later it was proposed that, um, in fact, Tibetan pl Plateau is so high and elevated because the Indian plate, it went beneath the, the uh, uh, the, uh, the plate in of uh, Asia, and it, what, what, it, what it did was it kind of uh, lifted the, the uh, Eurasian plate above. And because of that, the Tibetan plateau is so vast and uh, elevated. So if I give you an example, if, if you take uh, your two hands and slide one hand beneath the another, the, the first one will, will be higher. So the, 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 it's as simple as that. And the third, the third um, proposal, uh, it was later proposed, um, is the concept of uh, lower crystal flow. And this uh, concept is in fact the most widely accepted uh, one. Um, mm -hmm. uh, according to this uh, concept of lower crystal flow, the Indian continent, sorry, the Indian continent, it, uh, it w went beneath the, the uh, Tibetan plateau to some extent, and after that, as you know that um, deep inside the crust, the things get warmer and hotter, and it melts. So we have the, the Indian plate, which becomes hot, and it turns into uh, magma, and then it melts, and then it slowly flows, you know, like flows uh, beneath the crust. So this Indian plate, which, which, which has turned into magma is flowing beneath the crust, and it's of, and in the process, it's also heating up the plate uh, uh, on top of it. And because of the heating, it becomes more, you know, it, it heats up and it becomes, it, it floats, it becomes elevated. So these are uh, some of the f fundamental uh, theories or concepts behind the formation and the formation of such an elevated and vast Tibetan plateau. Um, so, as I, as I mentioned before, uh, Tibetan Plateau wasn't formed as a single unit. In fact, it was uh, formed in a successive continental fragments. So we have here on, the, on this map, uh, from north to south here is the Kunlun terrain, the Changdang terrain, the Songpen Kanze terrain, and the Lhasa terrain, and below that we have this Hi Himalaya. So uh, the scientists usually, uh, usually believe that this Hassad terrain and the Songpen Kanze terrain, which is the, the central part of the Tibetan Plateau, was the formed uh, the first. And later, the eastern part of Tibet was formed because of the compression, and this Kunlun terrain was the last to be formed uh, on the, on the, uh, in, in the geological history of the Tibetan Plateau. And then, you must have noticed these white lines. These, in, in uh, geological term, these, these are called situate zones. These are the zones where these two uh, continental fragments meet. And these situ zones, as you see this in this Yalung situ zone, these situ zones are important because these are the areas where we find minerals. As uh, my friend Matthew was uh, pointing out 
about the gamma mine, mining in Tibet. So this, in this map, uh, you can see all the red ones are the volcanic rocks. So the, these volcanic rocks are, uh, are found where these two continental plates uh, meet. So in, in other words, uh, the volcanic rocks are, are the uh, minerals are found where this situ zone is located. The, the one, one reason behind the, uh, you know, like uh, the formation of volcanic rocks or minerals uh, in the situ zone, uh, this is a cross section of the Tibetan Plateau. So we are in fact seeing the Tibetan Plateau from side, not from the top. So here, here is the Indian Plain, Himalayas, and as we go north, Lhasa, Changtang, Songbin, and Thadam, and um, we move further towards north. So here is the situ zone, in, in the Sangpo situ zone. And because, because of the uh, heating of Indian plate, it melts and it turns into magma, and then it rises up and it comes out and in this situ zone. Uh, situ zone is uh, usually a weak zone, um, or weak zone on the crust of the earth. So it's the point where the, the volcanic rocks uh, comes out to the surface. All right. So now um, I thought about talking about uh, the present situation uh, on the Tibetan Plateau. So as I mentioned before, uh, the Tibetan Plateau is uh, probably the most active region on, on the entire, uh, entire um, face of the world. And, uh, and quite rightly so, uh, you can clearly see a lot of fine lines uh, on this map. And these fine lines are different tectonic activities. So uh, some, some of them shows anticlines, synclines, faults, strike slip motion, folding, thrust faulting. So these are the different type of uh, tectonic activities which are going on, in the, on, on the Tibetan Plateau. But uh, because we have limited time, uh, I don't think we uh, I'll be able to talk about all the different uh, structures. But there, there are three main prominent ones. Uh, the first is uh, in this map is shown as black lines, which are called as thrust faulting. And uh, some of you might, might may have an idea about the thrust faulting, but uh, to give you a sense, uh, thrust faulting occurs when two plates collide, and one one plate it it or rides, you know, like it goes on top of the top of the second one. So we have these two plates colliding with each other, and this plate co goes on top of, top of this. So this process is called thrust faulting. So here, all along the Himalaya, and also towards the, towards the um, north and the northeastern region, you have the thrust faulting, when two plates collide and one, one uh, rides on top of the another. And then the second, uh, active structure which are found on the Tibetan Plateau are these red lines, which represent uh, strike-slip faulting. Uh, in simple terms, strike-slip faulting occurs when two plates collide and one plate slide past another. So when two plates collide, they are not uh, going on one on, one on top of another, but in fact they are moving in, in opposite way. One is sliding towards north, another is sliding towards south. So on this map, you see all these red fine lines. Uh, these are the locations where the strike slip faulting occurs. And then the third type of uh, tectonic activity, which are uh, quite common on the Tibetan Plateau, is shown here in the green line, are called normal faulting. Normal faulting, uh, in simple terms again, is uh, when two plates move in opposite way, the the section of the landmass between them, it subsides, it goes down. So in this cartoon, you see this plate moves towards this direction, which, which causes this plate to go subside down. So all these green fine lines, you see which are trending north-south, are the places where we see normal faulting. And, the, and on, on Tibetan Plateau, the normal faulting occurs because the, it is believed that since uh, past uh, 15 million years ago, the Tibetan Plateau is moving more towards east. So because this landmass is moving towards east, these north-south trending faults are formed. 
And then, um, as I mentioned before, we have these situ zones. So we have um, three different types of faulting, thrust, normal, and strikes defaulting. And then we have the situ zones, which are the weak zones. And then this image uh, shows the uh, GPS vectors. GPS vectors are very useful in uh, trying to understand um, the movement of the landmass. So the, the, this, um, all these pointed arrows, they uh, shows the movement of landmass to, to a certain direction. For example, uh, as we know, because of the collision of uh, Indian plate, uh, this landmass is moving towards north, and and because of the east-west uh, extension, this uh, part of the Tibetan plateau, that is the eastern part and the southeastern part, they are moving toward east and south. So the GPS vector is uh, shows a very interesting scenario where the uh, towards here the landmass is moving towards north, and towards the northeastern side it is moving towards south. So. Um, you know, like in the past, the several scientists have uh, tried to uh, actually uh, understand what, what actually is happening on, and they have proposed different theories, such as the theory of extrusion. When a landmass uh, acts as a punch, it ca kind of, it, it kind of uh, if you hit a punch, then some part of it is going to bend. So the theory is that the, in, in the Indian landmass acts as a punch, and because of this, the landmass is being going down towards the south. But then having said that, there are a lot of uh, different opinions, the debates, and d discussions uh, on this topic. And this is an um, image showing the focal mechanism. Focal, focal mechanism is kind of useful in uh, trying to understand um, the, the amount of stress which are being um, built uh, um, in a landmass. All right. So because of all these active structures, which I, which I uh, mentioned before, Tibet is also an area of high seismicity. Seismicity means, uh, as you know, uh, activities related to earthquake. So Tibet is very prone to earthquake. And in this map, um, we have used the uh, information from NEIC catalog data, and then we have uh, plotted them uh, on the map of the Tibetan Plateau to show, to, to, to uh, give you a sense of uh, how regular and how uh, often earthquakes occur. So in this, we have only, only uh, picked up uh, earthquakes of magnitude more than five between 1973 and 2012, which is the uh, latest uh, information we have. And uh, we have, uh, as we can clearly see, the Tibetan Plateau is swarmed with uh, seismic activities. So, and these, uh, different sizes of the circles shows different uh, magnitude of the earthquake. And so here you have um, almost eight magnitude, another one here, another one here. And then uh, we also have like uh, earthquakes of smaller magnitude. But um, if I take one example uh, of a recent earthquake in Tibet, as we all know is, uh, is a 2010 earthquake which, which struck in the eastern part of Tibet. Uh, which is uh, called by USGS as the Yushu earthquake. This earthquake uh, struck the eastern part of Tibet on April 14, 2010 with a magnitude of um, 6.9. And uh, if you look closely, then you will notice that this earthquake occurred right on a fault. So here you have the fault here, we're running in a, uh, I should say, north western to north, uh, south eastern. And this, uh, this earthquake occurred right uh, on, on the top of the fault. So here I have a couple of images to show um, how devastating the earthquake was. So these are the two images before and after the earthquake. And you can clearly see uh, the, um, the devastation. Here you can see the rows of houses. And in the, in the uh, post-earthquake image, uh, you can see the uh, devastation all 
or to the, to the tone of issue. And here, um, there's uh, another image which shows uh, the damage to buildings. And um, as is quite obvious, here is the Kanzei Yushu fault, and, and the, the buildings which are closer to the fault have maximum damage, which are shown in red. And uh, as we move away from the fault, the damage is comparatively lesser. All right, so uh, to sum up, uh, I thought uh, maybe uh, I should sum up by saying why, why it is important to understand the geology of Tibet. Because uh, we, we, we all have uh, a great deal of knowledge about uh, the Tibetan culture and even the environment of Tibet, the environmental aspect of Tibet. But the, the geology is something um, which uh, I hope uh, maybe a, a new topic and uh, even I interesting one. Um, I personally feel that we need to understand the geology of Tibet because uh, to, uh, by, by, by having the knowledge of the geology, we can understand where the minerals are located, where the Chinese government uh, can have the mineral prospects. Uh, similarly, uh, the geology is very much related to the seismicity of the Tibetan plateau. Um, since since its in invasion of the, t the Tibet, uh, China have introduced, you know, like big projects like railways, like dams, like uh, you know, like um, the housing settlements. So uh, we need to understand this seismicity and the geology so that we can we can make a point. For example, uh, if China China is building a dam close to a fault. A, a seismically, seismically active fault, we have a point to raise that this dam is not safe. And in the future, if, if something occurs, uh, if some damage to the uh, dam occurs, this could have a ripple effect on the people living downstream. So I personally feel the, uh, we need to un understand the, the geology as well as the seismicity of the Tibetan Plateau, um, along with the environmental and the cultural aspects of Tibet. Thank you. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>